All right. Hey, hey, everyone. It's Sleepy Reader, a.k.a. Damien. This is my sleepy vlog number 93. And not only is it my sleepy vlog number 93, but it is my 10th anniversary. I'm not really going to make a big deal about it. I thought about doing a long Q&A or having a big live show or something, but I just didn't have the time. Um, time is on my mind. 10 years passing. You can watch yourself age on YouTube. It's, it's kind of a weird thing. And um, time... Uh, is a time management for finding time to do YouTube videos. Even now that I'm retired, I seem to have, have trouble fitting that in. Although in that first month, I did 17 videos, which is kind of ridiculous because I didn't know. I was just getting the hang of it, and I didn't have a lot of viewers, although I was totally happy with the small number of viewers I had at the time. Um, but... Yeah, I haven't, I haven't made a comic book video in four or five weeks. Only one person seemed to have noticed, uh, thank you, Bob, uh, that I hadn't been around. I did make a, a book haul video about two or three weeks ago, and then I've been on some live videos. Uh, so I was on live with Namin, a comic book worm, and Utaku, Utaku Tour Guide, cool guy, who um, both grilled me about my uh, life as a collector and my approach to collecting and that sort of thing, which kind of is a very recent Q&A, you might say, so no need to do one for this anniversary. And I will link it down below. I had a ton of fun with those guys. I also, several months ago, had a lot of fun talking about my history with comics uh, with uh, No Good Comics, Justin. So I'll link that one down below. There. Between those two, you get a lot of, uh, if you haven't watched my endless Q&As from other anniversaries, I think I did one on my fifth anniversary and my first anniversary, maybe my second or third too. Um, I don't know. Maybe sometime I'll do a call for questions again, but just didn't have time for it right now. But uh, it feels like this YouTube thing is all about time. Comic books feel all about time. One of the videos I did... Um, that maybe was my peak video, uh, even though the quality might not, you know, I now have a better camera and a better microphone. Other than that, I haven't gotten much better. But uh, I did a video called Why Are Comics So Addictive? And I did that like in my second month or so of being on YouTube. And that kind of was my grand statement. There, <laughs> I haven't had much to say since then, I suppose. Um, so maybe I'll put a link to that down below. I do, I have refined some of my ideas as talking about comics out loud for 10 years. And uh, one thing I re realized an addictive quality to comics for me is kind of involved with time. Comics, by combining words and pictures the way they do, and when put together just right uh, with and sequenced and everything, uh, give me the fastest hit of story possible. It's like a you know, shooting heroin into your veins instead of smoking it or something. I don't know. I haven't done either. Uh, but uh, or or just uh, breathing in the the fumes from someone else smoking pot or something compared to injecting something into your veins. Comic books are that heady shot of uh, a really fast, so quick in time. Uh, and that makes them extra addictive to me over other medium, I think. And why I'm, when the comics don't work, I'm disappointed because I'm not getting that hit. Uh, and <laughs> so uh, that's at least one of my additions to that whole uh, why are comics so addictive. Uh, I thought maybe of updating that in a more formal way. Maybe I will someday, but probably not. And uh, I've thought a lot uh, on YouTube because of YouTube and all this discussing about comics about old readers and new readers. I've also, you know, over the years, people, in fact, it started in my very first video where I was talking about some Peanuts comics and some uh, uh, Karl Barks comics I was trying to read with my daughter of how to get my daughter to become a comic book reader, which I did pretty much succeed. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of talk about, often they talk about comic book readers as just being old overweight guys like me uh, in their 40s and 50s, maybe their 30s, possibly, probably their 60s. Um, 
who uh, go to comic book shops regularly and obsess endlessly like uh, masturbating nerds or something over, over superheroes. But I really think, especially when the current waves of people coming onto YouTube, that we have all sorts of people. I think the, the nostalgia readers actually come and go, most of them. They start reading comics. I mean, they've read comics a long time ago. Some event, a movie, the New 52, something else um, calls them back to the comic book store, and for a while they dive in. And often they phase back out again. I mean, a lot of people phase in and out many times throughout their lifetime. And I think we're, we're see, you know, like when I started on YouTube, it was, I think, mostly the 80s generation of readers who were either had been reading all along, but were, were often coming back to comics. Um, maybe after having gotten more settled in jobs and families and such and had more time to pursue their more... Um, uh, frivolous <laughs> interests, you might say. And now I feel like we've been seeing a lot of people coming in from the 90s. But I also feel like we're seeing a lot of people who just became comic book readers at an older age, say in their early 20s or very late teens. I don't know if that's because of the movies, because of comics like Saga, um, various other things. It's not, people keep waiting for a flood of comic book readers and that seems to more ha be happening with manga than with our traditional um, you know US comics but I do think there's a steady influx and it's not just a bunch of old guys who've been reading comics all their life and obsessing about it all their life there's some some of us have been obsessing about it all our lives but other people are like I said coming in and out and then there's plenty of newer people they just don't for the most part at least with American uh, monthly issue kind of comics start when they're 11 years old or something the way the way we did when I was a kid. And when I was uh, <clears throat> talking to Otaku and Naman, I knew they liked the author Larry Hama, the right comic book writer. And I had been digging through my comics and I found these old Atlas comics and remembered from way back in my youth that I loved this comic, Wolf, and so I remembered that it was written and drawn by Larry Hama. It was the first time I'd heard the name Larry Hama. Um, let me readjust my screen here now if I can handle it. Ah, I have to do that. Okay. Bear with me. I don't do many live videos, but my recorded videos are as sloppy as any live video. Sloppier than most people's live videos. Well, this one's in the tape. I guess I, I have several copies of this. I guess when I was reading this, I was reading a different copy. Because uh, I just, I just reread the four issues of Wolf the other day. And so uh, in this short-lived short -lived, uh, comic book company, uh, Atlas was this barbarian comic called Wolf. This cover is by Larry Hama and... Um, uh, brain fart again. And uh, Claus Jansen, as are the interiors. I think it's a great, a great cover. And the story inside, written by Hama, is... It's a story for younger readers, I'd say. It's at least at this point, when I was rereading it, it seemed like a very familiar fantasy story about a prince whose uh, whose whose parents and kingdom were basically destroyed or taken over by an evil wizard and he's gone into um, exile and has been training ever since so that he can come back and take his uh, his kingdom back but it was a very satisfying first issue and then there's a I've misplaced it at the moment but there's a very satisfying Second issue, which is just one of Wolf's adventures along the way as he heads back towards his kingdom. Uh, and so I think the idea was to have a lot of adventures and build up uh, companions along the way. I love that panel there. Um, so this, to me, this was very promising. And if Atlas had continued, I think this could have gone on like, um, like the 
like Mike Grell's Warlord series and, and developed a richer and richer world as it went. I feel like Larry Hama had a lot of ideas in the back of his head when he started this. But in the weird way of, um, of Atlas Comics, after two issues, they changed the creative team. And so with issue three, there's a new artist and a new writer, which is odd because obviously Wolf was created by Larry Hama since he wrote and drew it. And uh, so now I think we have Jim Craig. No, someone named Leo Summers. And I looked him up. I don't think he's drawn a lot of comics, actually. He must have come in and out of the comic book field fairly quickly. His art's kind of interesting. And it's written by Steve Skates, who I mostly know as a uh, Bronze Age DC writer. I think he had a well-known Aquaman run, amongst other things. It looks totally different. It was a shock at first. The story's not bad. You could see that Steve Skates had a slightly different take on this world. And I think it was by the end of, uh, by the end of this issue, he, um, he has uh, Wolf's companion leave him. And um, let me see. Anyway, pretty cool art. It would have been interesting to see where Steve Skates would have wanted to take this. Oh, and we got a cool map of the world of Wolf at this point. What happened at his... Yeah, at the end of this issue, Wolf is completely alone now. So instead of that building up of companions, it looked like um, Steve Skates had a different idea. Pardon me if I'm not pronouncing Steve Skates' name correctly. Love the look there, too. Um, this is all 1974, I believe. Uh, maybe the last issue or two in 75. So then the final issue, and no Atlas comic made it more than four issues. I would say the average Atlas comic made it three issues. But a lot were just one issue, two issues, and a handful of them made it four issues. Now it is, who's the writer? The artist is Jim Craig, and the writer is Mike Friedrich, who is well known for Bronze Age Marvel, uh, but... Never made a huge mark. I think he made a bigger mark as a publisher of things like Star Reach. But um, uh, this one, now we, we, Friedrich decided, let's hurry up. Let's get him to the kingdom where he's going to, maybe he knew their time was running out. So let's get him to his kingdom where he's trying to regain his throne. But then we get this just kind of weird story with this weird monster. And so... Yeah, it all fizzles. I couldn't help but thinking, what if Hannah, Hama had, Larry Hama had stayed on it? Again, I kind of think of it in terms of like the long Warlord run that they had at DC. And Warlord was probably coming out around the same time. Now, Larry ha the Larry Hama issues in particular and the Steve Skates had quite a lot of potential. But these were still kind of awkwardly written like I really enjoyed them but there's a there's a context there where I know they're old comics they're the beginning of someone's career I know they're from 1974 1975 and I was thinking you know really because uh, people often talk about oh comics are not as good as they used to be but really uh, for you know someone without any of my nostalgia or issues about the past and stuff may think that the modern and there's so much more even though fantasy comics aren't really the most popular thing in modern comics there's so much more uh, and maybe they lose something in not having the basics but like birthright which is over now but and always had terrible terrible ugly covers but uh was beautiful on the inside birthright told this epic story in about 48 issues. You know, what if what if Wolf had had 48 issues? But uh, with uh, Williamson... Uh, what is Williamson's first name? Now I'm forgetting. Joshua Williamson, doing an incredible job in sort of structuring the story and bringing it, uh, making it get richer and richer as you go through and then bringing it to a really satisfying conclusion with a really wonderful... Uh, a wonderful uh, epilogue 
and or afterward i guess epilogue would be the right word anyway in some way this art is it's kind of chaotic compared to uh this kind of art i guess but it's hard for me to say that the comics of the past were better. And right now we have kind of a sword and sorcery story with all the DC characters, the Dark Knight of Steel, with incredible, beautiful artwork. Um, so I, and I don't mean to put down the past. I just mean to poke around at this <laughs> feeling of old guys like us, like they don't make comics like they used to. Sure, they don't make them like they used to. Um, but if you were craving some kind of fantasy stories, there's a lot of stuff to be found. Um, yeah, so there's this uh, Dark Knights of Steel. Here's a joke one, Lester of the Lesser Gods, um, which definitely plays on the whole Conan fantasy and the sword and sorcery fantasies that many of us, uh, particularly boys, grew up with and, and makes fun of it. Um, and then also kind of playing with one's knowledge of stories of barbarians and swords is this uh, comic called Barbaric, which features a talking axe, which forces our amoral barbarian to only kill bad people. <laughs> and it's got really cool art. I guess, again, the art is maybe chaotic looking compared to art of the old uh, when you're not used to it. But... Uh, the, the writing is, it's much lighter on its feet and uh, conceptually uh, has more sort of fancy things going on often. There's plenty of modern comics that totally belly flop for me. But um, another really cool one was Savage Hearts, uh, which takes place in kind of a fantasy jungle setting. Um I actually haven't read the final issue, but I was really enjoying it a lot. I need to dig up that final issue and read it. And it had a really cool sort of distinctive art style, really bright colors that I really liked. And then, of course, we've got Yusagi Yojimbo, which is kind of sword and sorcery of a, with a Japanese flavor and an uh, anim, an anthropomorphic flavor. Less sorcery. There's, there's uh, mythical ghosts and mythical beings uh, we have werewolves at times and things like that but often just uh swords and politics and stuff and then there's sort of sword and sorcery is once in future which is evokes all kinds of um british mythology you know starting with the arthurian legends and moving on from there uh so sort of a cross between sword and sorcery and buffy the vampire slayer or something set in england um with incredible art and incredible colors, uh, and maybe never, it, it's a surfacey book, right? It, it glides along the surface adventure to, after adventure, but kind of cool. And of course, Canto, which is like a deep fantasy, like Lord of the Rings-ish, Lord of the Rings meets Wizard of Oz or something. And, uh, and features yet another art style, kind of a heavier, heavier on the page somehow art style i have too many examples here curse words which is more the magic than the swords but uh somehow in my mind is relates and it's it takes a very humorous approach and creates a kind of satisfying story over i can't remember you know roughly uh this is the spring special but i think roughly over about 25 30 issues then there was a spoof on various Bronze Age stuff, including Sword and Sorcery, uh, called Bronze Age Boogie, which I think in the end didn't totally work for me, but had lots of cool stuff. And then, of course, we have the old characters who just keep getting rebooted in the present, like Red Sonia. Is this the one? <clears throat> this is the series written by um, Russell, by uh, Mark Russell. And uh, the art didn't do a lot for me i remember and the story was kind of not about sorcery it was about swords and politics again maybe in a way in its own way but completely different but closer maybe to yusagi ojimbo in a way um and then you know marvel recently has rebooted conan incredible covers <laughs> but i i was not a big fan of the stories and other people love this artwork but uh 
I would say I find Wolf much more satisfying, even though Wolf is maybe written with more innocence for a younger person. And here's Oberon, which is was a fantasy story that really belly flopped for me in the end. I had some hopes for it. Um, but yeah, this, this might be an example of where I clearly do prefer the old stuff. And of course, I love tons of old Conan and the like, but I, it just got me thinking about how how I totally read Wolf or old comics in general differently than when I read uh, new comics. In fact, I was thinking about it in terms of uh, that interview with Utaku and Naman because uh, um, Utaku mentioned that in my uh, comic book countdowns, I can be kind of rough on comics and say, well, I didn't, I didn't like these panels, so I'm not going to keep buying this comic. Um, whereas I'm very gentle on a comic like Wolf and I forgive it, its flaws. And I think the reason is, uh, again, context of right now when I'm buying new comics, there's too many comics to buy and there's a lot of good ones. And then some other ones that either aren't right for me or aren't good, um, depending on how you view that. Uh, and so with those, I, I just, I have so many to choose from that I make quick, harsh judgments and cut things off so that I can go read something else. Back in the day when Wolf was cutting, coming out, I couldn't get enough comics to read. Um, now I have too many comics to read. So that also is a different context in my reading. Um, well, Cover-wise, I, I am of the school of that the old covers were much better. And there's, there's exceptions, of course, going both ways. And speaking of old comics and reading differently in time, I've been looking at the old Jim Starlin comics. Um, I just did something on my computer. Hopefully it's not affecting the recording. Uh, I bought this, this very large size uh, collection that they just came out with. I think they called it a, uh, what did they call it? Now I can't remember. A gallery edition. I think they call it a gallery edition, which made me think maybe it would have original art or, you know, the original black and white scans. But it's just a big color edition. And it's it's beautiful. I really I love the Jim Starlin artwork from this period, uh, which would be, I think, whoa, 1974. This book is very fresh. And uh, Jim Starlin packed a ton of stuff in. So it's per page. So it's nice to have it bigger. And all that he did in these early issues, he did the, the writing, the drawing, the inking, the coloring. He did everything, somehow putting in tons of detail, which puts a lot of the modern comic book artists to shame, I think. Um, however, the, the story does get kind of overblown and silly in some ways, uh, but also kind of intense and fun. And eventually Starlin couldn't keep it up and got other inkers and colorists. Um, and I think towards the end, he, w he was doing kind of layouts with Steve Leoloa doing the, uh, the heavier lifting with the art. Um, but anyway, this got me, I, then I thought I was looking, because of this, I was looking at my, at, at Warlock, the very first appearance of Warlock as Warlock rather than him which was in Marvel premiere back in 1971. And I read, I had this comic as a kid and it was one, you know, perfect example of, you know, you had very little to read. And I remember I read this one over and over and over again, but realizing that it's um, copyright 1971, it messes with the timeline of how I owe, of what comics I thought I had. I thought in, in 1971, I only got two comics, maybe three. And suddenly, I know I got this power of Warlord, and so, Warlock, sorry. And so I'm wondering where I went wrong. Like, a part of my comic book collecting is connecting to my memory since I reacted so strongly to comics as a kid of searching through the past when I go to the very earliest comics I read the the first Avengers, first Captain America, first Ant-Man, and first Warlock. I thought, in my memory, I'd read Warlock several years later when I lived in Hawaii. 
because I thought by the time I moved, when we moved to Hawaii, that's when my parents' control of how many comics I bought kind of broke down. Uh, in part because we had no TV there, and maybe I was a bit older and a bit. Uh, well, you know, it probably I'd only been reading comics for about a year and a half when we went to Hawaii. But anyway, um, it's a beautiful, beautiful comic, and it's a really cool concept by um, Roy Thomas, sort of taking the idea that maybe comes from Stan Lee and Jack Kirby comics of these godlike characters and pushing it a little further. You know, what if this guy, the um, the high evolutionary, could who, who's created these characters, if he's essentially a metaphor for God, and one of his characters, uh, the Beast Man, as he's called, the uh, the man based on a wolf, is actually uh, what was I going to say? Is actually the devil, and then he brings in the warlock, who becomes the Christ-like figure, and it, he's playing with the idea of a superhero as Christ-like, and he also, you know, eventually as as the series continued, you know, tied it in with the whole anti-war movement and corrupt politicians who might really be the devil in disguise and stuff. This this page is interesting, beautiful page by uh, Gil Kane. In, in the first issue of Starlin's Warlock stories, he retells the background, the whole background of, of Warlock as him and then becoming Warlock and... Uh, his experiences with the um, high evolutionary, but he he pretty much copies a Gil Kane picture. So there's kind of Jim Starlin redoing this picture by Gil Kane, and there are differences. But I just thought it was interesting to see, and uh, totally digression here. But I, I then I started thinking about Jim Starlin of this era, who who felt so intense. And I feel like Starlin was a very interesting synthesis and starting points moving beyond of Kirby, Gil Kane, Ditko, and Jim Steranko all kind of in one. And I feel like that's, he really, I don't know if, you know, he would say those were his influences. But when I look at this stuff now and I'm thinking about, about influences, that's what I see. I see all these things coming together for kind of this wild, intense, very personal, over-the-top, yet comic booky kind of style. Now his style, when he draws, doesn't have all that personality to it, in my opinion. Although, I'll have to do a side-by-side -side comparison of, because I have his most recent uh, Dreadstar book, where he came back to Dreadstar uh, on Kickstarter. Um, so maybe I'll compare this to that sometime. But so, yeah, my whole, uh, I, I'm, I'm reaching forward and being interested in the history of comics as it goes forward and all the new stuff. And I go back and I'm looking at the history there, but I'm also looking at myself and what was I doing? What was I thinking? What was I obsessing about? So it's kind of got a narcissistic side to it, but it's weird realizing that your sense of time in your memories is so off. Um, and of course with YouTube, I guess for the past 10 years, I have a record of all my comic book reading and all that I was thinking of. And maybe that makes it appealing because I've lost, I've lost the real records of the, in my brain of what I was thinking and doing when I was 10, 11, 12. Um, I have bits and pieces and, a, a kind of broken, a broken stained glass window of memory that, uh, that these comic books represent. Anyhow, I think that's that's enough for this sleepy vlog. A few of you out there have been with me since the very beginning. Minutia Minute, perhaps you're watching this. Uh, most of you have not, um, which is completely understandable. <laughs> and uh, there's there's more to come. I uh, on the subject of time, also, I'm always wishing I could do more live hangouts with people. There's a whole list in my head of people I mean to invite to come on my channel. I basically don't do live hangouts most of the time. It's uh, because the times when it would be good for me are like after 10 p.m. my time, maybe 9.30 my time, 
And for most people in the other time zones, that's very late, very, very late. And a lot of times by 10, 10 o'clock, 10.30, I'm pretty pooped anyway. Um, I can't believe I used to make all those videos after everyone else went to sleep because we used to spend so much time getting my daughter to sleep back then. Um, anyway, there should be more videos, maybe more live videos with guests and stuff. Um, sorry to people who reach out to me and I always have to say I'm not free. I'm, I'm just I'm bad at that time management. Um, and I always viewed being here on YouTube as conversation with friends when you have the time. It can be time delayed. Each, each of these videos is a little message out there for someone to listen to when they have the time to listen to it. So we don't have to be available at the same time to develop friendships or conversations or acquaintanceships. Um, and that's kind of a miracle of technology, I guess. <laughs> Okay, talk to you all later. Bye-bye. If I can make this stop. Yes, I will.